All right, we're going to transition into uh, our, our panel discussion. What we've asked the panelists to do to start off is very briefly, about a minute, minute or two, uh, describe who they are, agency, and really with a focus on assets. So getting back to the conversation about moving in the direction of opportunity, um, a lot of that can start with the assets that we all bring to the conversation. And assets can be, they can be financial maybe, they can be um, technical expertise like uh, Paul mentioned before from the corner. They can even be background or, or different perspectives. So um, as you introduce yourselves, you could think about introducing yourselves a bit with the spirit of that, uh, the assets you bring to the table, that would be great. So we'll start, are these in order down? So we're gonna start with, um, yeah, with Mike Fensner. That'd be me. What's prepared go first, no. Uh, so Mike Besner, Assistant Director of Transportation for Clackamas County. I've been with the county uh, actually since 98 um, and in lots of different roles, but all in transportation and been active up on the mountain for really almost all that time, um, doing a lot of bridge projects up there. We've replaced a heck of a lot of bridges over the Salmon River, one more to go, um, and on um, the Sandy and the Zigzag. Um, so some of the work we've done since 2011, I limited it to just that, you know, the damage back then to Lolo Pass Road included our bridge, and that bridge actually was pretty new. It replaced another bridge that had been damaged by a prior flood, and the old bridge had piers in the water, and the new bridge was an extra long single span. We were thinking, well, we should be pretty safe now, and we were not. But the good news is the bridge was on piles, and the bridge was actually fine. All we had to do is um, repair the approaches, which still takes time through emergency permitting and, and everything, things you can't get taken care of ahead of time. Um, you can't get an advanced emergency permit before the emergency. Um, otherwise, we would. But uh, so the bridge turned out to be in good shape, and it did survive. Um, we also repaired the road, as everybody knows, what we talked about in the, the photo there. The, we also rep, uh, stabilized the bank a couple areas on Lolo Pass. Um, the county actually purchased one property to do some bank stabilization. It was a property that didn't have anything on it at the time. The Barlow Trail Road um, also had some damage. It actually had an old revetment that had been, been built by the Corps of Engineers that the county went in. Did, it, it was damaged in 2011, and we did some repairs to that as well. And then the feasibility study that we did um, with help from Federal Highway, uh, Western, Western Federal Lands Office in Vancouver, we looked at, well, you know, if we, rather than keeping, as Jay mentioned, repairing Lolo Pass Road, which was expensive, and we were lucky to get FEMA funding for this event, but not, not every event's going to qualify for FEMA funding. What could we do? And unfortunately, the feasibility study of alternatives determined that there are not feasible alternatives, which is OK. I mean, that's part of why you study it. Um, they were all very, very expensive and had some serious environmental drawbacks. So we're going to be taking the, the stance of trying to make what we have as resilient as possible so that if, if the water does come up again, uh, which it will, that our infrastructure will be in better, better will be better able to withstand it and get back up and running as quickly as possible. Um, part of it also, we've gotten um, some grants very recently to do some paving up in the area. That includes um, uh, Salmon River Road, but it also includes Lola Pass Road all the way to the end of county maintenance. It's not going to happen probably for three, four years. Um, that's a federal lands access um, program grant, so federal money. Part of that, we're going to be doing a little more bank stabilization, hopefully extending some of what we already did. So um, we're active up there. Uh, like I say, we've been replacing lots and lots of bridges and culverts throughout the years. And uh, that's, what we've, that's what we've done up there. Talked about communication in 2011. One thing that's very different this next time is the county's social media um, presence is a lot more mature now than it was six years ago. So I have every confidence that one message will get across in, in, fu in the future. It's, it's Facebook and Twitter, very, very, very active. Uh, Don mentioned sediment. The other thing we've noticed is the log jams. 
they just ricochet the water outside the channel. That's actually what happened at Lolo Pass Road right there. There was a huge log jam. And what the Corps did in the 60s is they actually cleared all the trees along the banks, which you could see in that picture. And so for a long time, there were no log jams. And so for a long time, there weren't a lot of issues. But the trees grew back. Obviously, we're not doing that anymore because we can't. And so as a result, if you were out there in, in, in 2011, the trees were all just falling, one every 30 seconds, it seemed like. And they go right into the river, and they, they stick, and then they shoot the water off in another direction. So it's just another challenge that we face up there. Um, that's about it. Uh, Jeff Stallard with uh, Clackamas Water Environment Services. We're the sanitary provider up there. Um, we operate six pump stations and a treatment plant in the area, and uh, we recently completed a master planning effort looking holistically at the system, what the future needs would be, what the future capacity, and also condition. Um, and as part of that project, we did a um, evaluation in terms of where our assets sit with relation to the channel migration zone, and two of the... <clears throat> Three, three major assets are at risk currently. Um, the Timberline Rim Pump Station, which I know you've seen this slide before, but I'll talk, talk a little more in depth. The Timberline Rim Pump Station there and the Sandy River Lane Pump Station are on opposite sides of the river, but both fall well within the migration zone. And at, at, uh, my third day on the job, I went to visit the Sandy River Lane Pump Station, and it's about 30 feet and a 30 foot drop off down into the river. So it's uh, amazingly close. Um, it was kind of my, I went in March and the river was roaring and I had never actually gone up there in the, in the, in the high, high flow. Uh, I'm typically up there in the summer months uh, doing some hiking. But uh, so we are currently as part of that project um, working to identify um, available uh, properties to purchase to relocate those uh, two pump stations. Um, as, as part of the master plan, they did an evaluation, a feasibility study of different areas and how far we could move them versus cost. These are pump stations, so sewer flows by gravity to them. And so, you know, without adding more pump stations, so there's a, a balancing trade-off of uh, working with the land out there. And so as part of the master plan, there was a couple of properties that were identified as reasonable approaches to moving our infrastructure further away from the migration zone. Um, and so we're in the process right now of uh, working through trying to purchase a few properties to move that project forward. Um, as I had mentioned previously, the force main itself was replaced, and I believe it was in the 2000, late 2000s time period. They did a, 2007, they did a um, directional drill underneath the river, and so where we put it deepest was where the river was currently uh, flowing, and now the deepest part is actually in a dry area of the riverbed, and where we put our, uh, <clears throat> where we come up out is, uh, just has a couple feet of cover now, and it's in the main part of the river channel, and so we, are, we have a risk there, and so one of the things we did in that master planning effort w was to evaluate if a boulder came down and took our force main out. It's our single force main that crosses the river. What could we do in an emergency situation? And they evaluated several options for what we could quickly implement um, to continue to provide sewer service um, to the folks on the other side of the river to get it over to Timberline Rim. Um, so I would envision construction roughly if we can find some properties to purchase and design them would be not next summer, but the summer after we might be uh, moving into some construction. So two, two years from uh, be 20, 2019, 2020 time period would when we, we would look to be putting in a force main and two new pump stations in that area to, to get our infrastructure out. Um, one thing I'll comment on, um, you know, our, our, the Timberline Rim pump station currently sits on the river, uh, just, just off the river. And when we move that pump station out of the area, I, we should, I encourage my organization at any rate to look at could we use that property for some of these habitat or, or widening of the streams or what could we use that property for to have a more positive impact and I hadn't really hadn't even been a part of the conversation or thought until some of the folks talked today so I think that's something that we should 
as an organization look at? My name is Steve Wise. Thank you all for gathering here uh, and considering is that on. Yeah, uh, how we can work together for the health of the Upper Sandy and its populations, both people and fish. Um, the Watershed Council, as some of you may or may not know, is a independent nonprofit, but we work with the community, with uh, residents, with landowners, with agencies, and uh, volunteers to restore and protect the. Uh, ecological, cultural, and historic resources of the basin. So in, in terms of this work, it's what we call restorative flood response, um, and very much in line with what the, the introductory comments were talking about, moving toward possibility, moving toward uh, strategic action, not only planning, but doing it within a very well-planned framework. Um, the, the picture on the bottom right there is from my history. I came back from Chicago. I did four years of work and service at a nonprofit there called the Center for Neighborhood Technology. And yeah, evidence that it still, still remains. It, it, I say that because it affects my approach to resiliency and some other perspectives. I, you know, I thought I was coming back to nature. So the picture there in the middle is me on the Salmon uh, River confluence, you know, pointing both directions because you got the Sandy on one side and the Salmon on the other and all sorts of trouble in between. Salmon River Park was hammered during the 2011 flood. They nearly lost their water system and they lost part of their transportation. People found out down there how much at risk they are at the peninsula right between these two rivers. So it's a critical point, both in my understanding and, and, and in the inflection of what directions we're taking in the Sandy. Um, the, the other picture there is one of the resources that we developed in response to this. Kind of some big words, but as small as the ones we could find to describe how the river works, what channel migration means, relying a lot on the county study and, and, and the language there in the mapping, but then also looking at the notion that um, what we call restorative flood response is addressing habitat and homeowners and infrastructure together and finding these places where um, restoring habitat, restoring floodplain function actually can reduce risk for the built infrastructure and work within the confines of both processes, the natural need of the river to move and the the need of people to be safe, secure, have economy, and so forth. Um, and it, we, we, as we do as a, a part of a broader partnership in the Sandy, our restoration program addresses key habitat constraints. Um, it's been going on for 10 years now as a partnership. This is the state of the Sandy we published about a week ago. I have a small number of copies, but addressing this fish issue, what's been going on for fish habitat and how it's been working. The good news is, Three of the four listed species, their populations are increasing significantly since the, the dams were removed from the Sandy and the Little Sandy, uh, little, uh, little Sandy. And since this concerted, science-based, well-prioritized restoration campaign has gone on in the floodplains, in the side channels, in the tributaries, Sam River and Still Creek. And then the pictures up here at the top, uh, based on an assessment we did of approximately the same reach of the river that's the other thing. Restorative flood response, we want to be reach-based because you have to deal with the river in long stretches. As somebody said before, you can't just deal with one property and have any impact. You have to look at where the river is going to function and work, work within that reach, uh, reach scale strategy. So we're looking at projects that are ecologically effective, that reduce risk or at least don't cause any other risk to homeowners and infrastructure um, that are affordable because of the place that I work in Chicago, we came up with a real short couplet, the sustainable must be attainable. You can't propose things that are really wonderful for the ecology but unaffordable or impose unreasonable costs or constraints on the community because people won't go for that. So you have to deal with things that are affordable. And of course, since these fish are listed threatened, there are constraints in terms of what's permissible and legal. What we propose has to be permissible and legal and the Corps has helped us take steps toward defining most productive ecological steps that are also within the permit boundaries. Um, so we looked at where the opportunities were for major restoration and floodplain reconnection. The first one we took on was at the, uh, the Columbia Land Trust floodplain upstream of the Timberline Rim neighborhood, and that's the picture in the upper left. We built a series of log jams. We reconnected a side channel to divert a portion of the flow of the river most of the year, and I'm really glad to hear Don say that they're seeing positive effects from that. We, 
we don't want to, you know, we, we promised the state that we wouldn't make any false expectations. We're only diverting a small portion of the stream, but the idea is that that diverts some of the river's energy, disperses it across the floodplain, and creates habitat for these emerging coho and other fish that are finding these places when they get re reopened up, when it disperses the water and gives them place to hide and rest and rear and migrate. So the wonderful thing was when we went out and looked at, at the, we had a storm shortly after this project was finished last year that was about 3,000 cubic feet per second, which is a very moderate flow, actually about the same flow that took out the Marmot Dam Coffer Dam, it's about 2,900, and this was last October. So we took out and we, we, we were out there with a tour of neighbors looking at things as people looking down there. And lo and behold, they saw fish in the pool. Well, this was great. You say, you know, early results, observation, incidental. But so we, we, we took a really close look. We used our high, high definition camera technology and found out that that cub, that, that, that the fish last year was wearing a Cubs hat. It's like, wow, this is really, really an amazing coincidence. The World Series wasn't over, and yet there was a fish with a Cubs hat on in our pool. Well, you know, and we say this year we had to remarkably, uh, well, the, the storm that was out last week was predicted to be about the same level. We had a, our, our Sandyversary party celebrating the October 19th date when the storm washed away the Coffer Dam. River flowed free 10 years ago. So happy Sandyversary. It's a momentous occasion. And there was a storm coming up. He said, well, if you want to see what the river looked like 10 years ago, go up there Saturday afternoon. It should, the, the model's predicting it'll peak at about 2,900, which is about the same flow. So it's a remarkable coincidence. But the model didn't take account of the early snows didn't take account of the atmospheric river of moisture coming flying off the ocean like it does. And that 2,900 CFS storm was actually 3,000. No, sorry, 30,000, almost 30,000. It was 29,000. So it was 10 times bigger than the model was predicting. This is the national NOAA model that I look at fairly frequently. You get the advanced hydrologic system on, on the web. It's got a good predictive model out a week or so ahead of the river. So here's what 30,000 looks like. You know, go back. That was that was 3,000. This is the log jam all poking up above. But in 30,000, it's buried. But it, apparently, there was some discernible impact downstream, diverting some of that flow into the floodplain, spreading out some of the energy, and providing habitat because we've seen evidence of fish in there. So we sent back our super duper restoration cam this year, and by golly is wearing a Houston Astros cap. Imagine that I hadn't even looked at this result until this morning because our, our science team was just fresh, fresh doing it. But uh, it's a remarkable prediction system for a lot of things, particularly river health. Um, but what, so all, all joking aside, we, we, the, the Watershed Council, we like to say we have no legal, regulatory, or other authority, but we use it to the greatest extent possible when everybody says yes. So this kind of community-based, uh, collaborative, voluntary process is what we do. We use the best science we have, and we try to put it in plain language. I, mean, I have a few copies of this and a smaller number of copies of this, but we can get you these if you're interested. Um, and we're really excited to help develop this process and, and find ways that habitat and homeowners and infrastructure can help to make the Sandy a healthy place for the long run. Thanks. Excuse me. Well, I don't have any baseball-related props, so <laughs> at a disadvantage here. But <laughs> so I am David Lentzner. I work for the Department of Land Conservation and Development, and I coordinate our Risk Map program. And so, Risk Map is a FEMA initiative. Um, the Map stands for Mapping, Assessment, and Planning, and it's in coordination with the state, which in Oregon is run through DLCD. Um, and it has a couple of functions. Um, in the, so, as Jay mentioned earlier, this whole meeting is really a function of the Risk Map program. Uh, this concept of the resilience meeting. And it's been kind of a developing idea. Um, this is the fourth meeting that we've had in the state of Oregon. And this one's very different than the ones we had previously, which was very much thanks to Jay's guidance and, and interest in the best way to focus um, our capacity and our interest in a particular topic. Um, so uh, the risk map program is statewide. It's a um, Part of it has to do with doing the floodplain mapping updates, the firm update that we are seeing in the in the Sandy. Think of that as sort of the regulatory portion going along with the National Flood Insurance Program, the uh, development regulations. And then there's this non-regulatory portion, which I think this fits into, where um, a lot of what we think about in terms of FEMA is regulatory. But here, FEMA provides us with resources 
and opportunities to get people together to have conversations about how we can look on a multi-hazard basis, not just at flooding, and to think about what are the kinds of local solutions we can do. Those interests tie in very well with the state's interests as well. We're both looking at how do we reduce uh, loss of life, loss of property, loss of natural resources due to natural hazards, and how can we implement uh, mitigation activities, how can we implement these solutions that have been identified locally or on the state level that these are the things that we want to accomplish. Risk map provides capacity to do that. Um, the schematic that you can see there, which shows kind of the risk map cycle of identifying risk, assessing risk, communicating risk, and mitigating risk, ultimately trying to get to that fourth spot of how do we actually implement ideas, how do we get beyond. We've, uh, you know, FEMA often will put in this money to map these hazards, and then how do we use that information that we've gotten to see some real change that can protect people and protect their property. If you look on uh, FEMA's website, like if you were to look up this schematic, you would see some text that talks a lot about how it relates to flood specifically. Um, but the schematic itself doesn't talk about flood. And we've tried in Oregon, because we have so many geologically based hazards here in Oregon, that flood is not sort of the primary dominating uh, risk that we have of how we can use this resilience process to look at a lot of different types of hazards. And if we think about channel migration, it sort of is a subset of flooding, but there's a lot of other issues as well. In many ways, as we've had conversations, it's a lot like coastal erosion processes. Um, you know, landslides are issues that go along with it. It's not just a matter of people getting wet. So uh, I think we have at the state a lot of appreciation for FEMA Region 10 and their flexibility in letting us sort of design these meetings, these programs in a way that's fitting best with the needs in the local community. And we have this particular issue, which we can see is a very dangerous issue, a very costly issue, and to be able to focus our resources on it specifically is a great thing. Um, so risk map, a lot of how it operates as a state program is, is through coordination, is bringing people together. We have some really core partners at DLCD that we work with as we go around the state and try and identify these issues. They include the Partnership for Disaster Resilience with Josh and with Mike at the University of Oregon who provide tremendous planning support. Um, Dogami is, a, is an agency that we work with extensively in developing the hazard mapping and risk analysis tools um, and the Office of Emergency Management as they help guide um, through the FEMA grant processes and Silver Jackets, um, which has been um, a, been able to develop a number of very varied types of activities, uh, measuring high water marks, um, um, posting high, those high water marks is one example of things. But we've uh, we've heard from Paul a little bit about what they're working on here and developing a plan. We have a lot of uh, possibilities to do a lot of different things throughout the state. So that's what's going on with Risk Map. What we can offer. There is some money available. Um, David Rattay mentioned a little bit about being able to provide non-regulatory mapping products. There's a um, CTP grant program, community, no, I'm going to forget it now. <laughs> community Technical Partnership. No, Coordinating Tech, yeah, sorry. Coordinating Technical Partnership grant program so we can look at developing mapping products and, and more risk analysis products as well as uh, capability for planning regulation um, and looking at comp plan issues that could be, um, that these issues could fit in well with. Um, but most of all, it's about coordinating people, bringing resources together, bringing in the experts from all these different fields together. And so, you know, it's very gratifying to be at this meeting and to have so many experts here. Um, and not only that, but to have, with Oregon Solutions and Silver Jackets, to have a, a process for moving forward with actual implementation. Um, a lot of this, you go into the resilience, but then the next step, it's hard to make that next step. Um, you have to go back and find the, the local uh, political will capacity to move forward with projects. So since we already have some things in place, um, certainly feel very optimistic about this project um, and really glad that everyone could be here. And Jay, who has uh, done just a tremendous job setting this all up, I, I think. So thank you. One thing I didn't uh, mention that I think is critically important is uh, that Oregon Solutions can provide as a uh, neutral forum. So we uh, don't have a presupposed outcome or list of solutions. That really is something that comes out of the, the group itself. And a little more detail on what a project team would look like. We generally have a project team that looks something like uh, what we have here. Uh, we want to have all the people at the table that have 
uh, can benefit <clears throat> uh, as well as can contribute. So um, that could include uh, anything from the Tim Rim Homeowners Association of saying, you guys are going to provide uh, conduit for information back and forth between residents uh, to a state agency uh, doing uh, risk mapping. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, another uh, group that are we call interested parties. Uh, so we may have a 30 member or 25 member contingent team of a project team that we expect to have at the, the table that are going to contribute. And then there may be uh, some cases we have 30 to 50 others that say we're, we're really vested in the outcome here. We want to follow uh, this uh, project, uh, but we don't want to be at the table. We may uh, serve as a resource to jump in when necessary. So maybe that's somebody like the Columbia Land Trust may say we're going to track this and uh, make sure uh, we know what's going on and maybe we have a role uh, somewhere uh, along the way in, in some of the land transactions or uh, some of the land uh, trusts, for example, get expertise on that. So that's kind of what the project team would, would look like. Um, and then the, the, the piece that we haven't really worked out that I think we need to put our heads together is the community engagement. Um, we've got resources through the Silver Jackets. We've got potential resources through Oregon Kitchen Table. What is the best way to follow up on the public engagement work that uh, has already been done, that Jay's worked on through his survey, and uh, figure out how best to engage the community and have the residents uh, be actively involved in any kind of land transactions that, that may come along the line. So, thanks. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of touched on, and I guess um, thank you for covering Silver Jackets a little bit. <laughs> it took the onus off of me a little bit, but um, so yeah, I, I'm with the core. Uh, I am the, the Silver Jackets kind of coordinator for the Portland district. But when we were putting this together, there was um, some uh, some slides that kind of talked very core centric. But what I wanted to focus on today or right now is that when we talk about Silver Jackets, it's a term that some people may be familiar with, some people may not be, but it really isn't a core specific thing. It's uh, It's a combination of many partners, uh, federal state partners. And on this slide, you see at the bottom, <clears throat> the Silver Jackets kind of umbrella covers obviously core, but also includes NRCS, USGS, Office of Emergency Management, DLCD at the state. Um, National Weather Service plays a very uh, key role in the, in the Silver Jackets community. And then um, of course there's FEMA. So it's, it's really, the notion is that we, it's a national initiative. Every state, well, except every state except for Hawaii and Connecticut for some reason, but most every state has a Silver Jackets team. And the idea is that all, each agency that participates in Silver Jackets have um, programs and grants and different type of mechanisms that they have able to um, help communities, but also expertise. So it's really a, a way of providing those expertise to help communities solve some of these issues that we talked about today. That's all. Hi, everybody. Oh, Vicki Peterson with the Forest Service. Um, and staying true to the conversation today or the focus of this piece is the opportunities. And um, the Mount Hood National Forest Zigzag District has received national recognition for the work they've done in, in stream restoration and all. So I think that we bring a lot in the realm of expertise, partnerships, collaboration. And Gerald, I think your focus on that piece of it is where we could be most supportive and make progress that way. We do have some funding available where we help communities and able to provide some seed money. It's not a substantial amount, but we've done that with the Clackamas River Basin and probably able to do some more um, elsewhere in support communities. We're also getting ready we just completed the five-year Still Creek watershed improvement there, and we are looking at our next project um, this winter. So if there's input to provide, we'd be happy to receive that and see if there's linkage there. And probably my, my um, just a, a tone of hesitance is in the realm of like a land exchange, things like that. Um, 
the, the workload and all that goes associated with that, uh, tribal mitigation and 99% um, of the zigzag district, I would say, is enlisted fish habitat and there's a lot of wilderness on there that it is very boxed in. So I think if we worked on the restoration piece is where we could be most influential and supportive. Um, and, and put that in a context for what if we looked at that as a new model um, for innovative floodplain management decision making, right? Understanding that the, maybe the way that we approach these um, opportunities and challenges in the past um, hasn't got us the outcomes that we want. And so if we were looking at all of the different assets that we have in the room, the different perspectives, um, the different infrastructures, the different private property rights, community property rights, fish, everything, what would it look like to make decisions in the Upper Sandy uh, in a different way? And how might that be a model for the rest of the state of Oregon? Certainly Upper Sandy isn't the only <laughs> area that's going to go through this. Um, there's other parts of the nation that are dealing with us. We've got um, you know, potentially FEMA and federal partners watching. So what would that look like? So I'm going to open it up. Anybody on the panel want to take the first shot at thinking about sustained engagement and what a new model for decision making might look like? And maybe Vicki, your last comments are illustrative of the chat. I mean, you got a lot of different uh, things at play, different uh, partners, different rules, different regulations. What would that look like? I'm not, I'm not asking you to take the first response. I'm saying that your last comment was, you know, tribal, uh, you know, all of that stuff makes this challenging. So anybody want to take a first stab from the panel perspective on what that could look like? Um, so, so with risk map, um, one of the dimensions of it is that it can serve as a way to uh, maintain connection between the state and federal government with communities. Um, so every five years, a community uh, redoes their natural hazard mitigation plan. Um, and that's, I believe, is an ongoing process right now. Um, so the risk map program has an opportunity to continue to stay involved with the community between that five-year period. Uh, we have planners at DLCD that work on these plans as well as planners at OPDR. Um, so the opportunity exists to try and maintain that focus and to not lose the focus. So I guess I would put that out as a little bit of a question in terms of as this hazard mitigation plan is being redone and to Jay, um, how do you see leveraging this continuing connection so that this, uh, the information that we're learning about today doesn't get lost in that five-year period or before it maybe gets revisited again in a hazard mitigation plan? Thanks, yes. Uh, the county's working with uh, Josh's group uh, for the update of our county's natural hazard mitigation plan, which has long identified channel migration zones as uh, one of our priorities. Um, it was uh, last updated, I think adopted at least, and approved in 2015. So it was just in the works right after this flood event, and we highlighted it then. But we also highlighted that there were a number of um, possible ways of approaching this going forward. And that's what we are looking right now. This is, this is a guiding process we're talking about as we go forward to update that plan for the county. And we want it to be meaningful. We want it to... Uh, hopefully influence land use decision making. I know at a national level, there's, there's always been a push that the mitigation plan needs to tie in to the comprehensive plan um, in terms of influencing it or, and supporting it. And that's, uh, that's still a realm that we need to uh, put more investment in here in the county. But I think the, the involvement of the stakeholders and the, you know, I, I, as I've said earlier, I think today's an embarkation point and so this, just this kind of group and this kind of, of involvement is, is what's going to be most uh, important going forward, that we have a collective understanding and the, 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 the way we started this with the community up there in 2013-14 was really coming in and listening and having um, a, an appreciation for the community's concerns, even if they were really critical concerns of theirs about the county and, and the state and federal partners too, we needed to understand what their criticism was. We needed to assure them that we were, we're a stakeholder too, 
And uh, I think one of the biggest things is establishing and maintaining trust uh, between uh, our role and their perspective, um, because it's that trust that really is the, the leverage for taking any kind of initiative. And um, today's an example of how I'm hoping we're demonstrating the trust we've, we've worked hard to try and earn and, uh, and bring back around again, even though it's taken a long time. So let me see if I can maybe tease this out uh, a teeny bit more. But how, how does the decision making um, occur right now? So for example, um, Mike, are you and Steve um, talking when there's a, a road reconstruction that happens? Or you know, Paul, when is the Army Corps um, pulled into conversations with, with Jeff with your group? Um, is that happening now, or is that something that would be, uh, in terms of a new model, would that be kind of useful in moving forward? And if so, what what would that look like? And Michael, I saw a hand, so if oh, I'll get back to you. Okay, excellent. Well, I know that we do interact with with our partners. You know, we have a transportation system plan that was a year long public public involvement effort, uh, God, it's probably done three years ago, something like that. Um, but it definitely didn't address, you know, it doesn't have any separate section on flooding. You know, of course, we have these issues in a lot of other places in the county as well. It's not a Sandy River issue, but we have other rivers that flood in different ways and for different reasons. Um, you know, the county also doesn't have a flood management district anywhere yet. Um, but we don't have that. So there's not a dedicated funding source for this, which is another challenge the county has. You know, our, our transportation dollars are all road fund. We definitely do partner, you know, and we have uh, Devin Patterson is uh, an employee of ours who he, he, he's the one who reaches out. He's actually um, sits on a couple watershed councils. I don't know how active he is with yours, Steve. Well, uh, that's sort of my, my answer to that question, particularly with transportation, is that our, our interactions tend to be on a project by project yeah. basis where, for example, um, we, we, we talked with the part Department of Transportation about the big conundrum in these floodplain project is what to do with all the rock. So we're doing essentially an industrial scale excavation to reconnect floodplain processes and the regulatory structure we, we engage with the Corps of Engineers and the state agencies, DSL and so forth, the regulators on floodplain development standards that say, Although these levees that were built in 1965 and after are composed of largely floodplain material, that material must leave the floodplain so as not to violate the standards for filling in the floodplain in typical development code. So that's sort of a, uh, and we said, well, could we reuse the, ro the, 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 the rock as road material? Didn't work out that time. And then in another case, the interaction is that uh, on near Forest Service territory and on other private territory, there's some blocked fish passage uh, from from undersized and underperforming culverts. So we've been talk we've talked in the past with the transportation department and other agencies and private landowners. Say, well, what can we do together to find resources to address what are habitat problems from our perspective, but our infrastructure service questions for the community and sometimes parts of a registered uh, bridge uh, set for the county that thus invokes more regulations and things. But and again, from my perspective on what, what we would like to see as a different model is that say, when, when the, the county erosion mitigation uh, study does, lines out these projects, say, well, these are the places where we could open up the floodplains that would benefit the stability of county infrastructure, whether it be roads, water systems, sewer, and so forth, how could we make that into a concerted county infrastructure and habitat program? We come at it as a habitat and infrastructure program, but it really ends up looking the same as far as what happens on the ground. That we say, well, then you would get different resources that, for example, it's too specific, but, but I've read about the TIGER program, innovative transportation projects at the federal funding level, where it would be a, we run into the problem that to really uh, redress historic impacts on the floodplain, it's beyond the scope of habitat dollars alone. So our projects might be ha half a million dollars is a big project for us and we can accomplish a lot in habitat, but that doesn't get us to 
dealing with uh, Barlow Road as it comes alongside the Sandy Salmon floodplain, which is our next project. So we see these, inter, you know, the inter intersections between actions that would be good for the river and for habitat and that would reduce risk for infrastructure, but we're not quite in the position to say, okay, how can we bring the infrastructure investment in to do that reinforcement in the name of infrastructure, but also bring the habitat up at the same time? That's sort of a new, a new inflection of how I'd like to see it happen because we, we, it, like, right. in the habitats, we know where the opportunities are. In the infrastructure sense, we know where the opportunities are, and they're sort of the same thing, but point right. from, from different directions. So if, uh, to sort of restate it, so if uh, a mitigation project is identified, whether that's a transportation um, risk reduction project, infrastructure, maybe it's even a portion of a community that's trying to be protected, that would be the identified risk reduction project, but that rather than transportation going it alone, we would try and identify other players that could bring resources, assets to the table to achieve multiple objectives rather than just a single objective. Is that kind of what I'm hearing you say? Okay. Chris? Thanks, Jay. have master plans, but they're not integrated. So just speaking to what we were just talking about, maybe it would make sense for Oregon Solutions, for example, to help the agencies and, and watershed councils and neighborhood groups integrate and coordinate their master plans so that there's a common vision, so that when you're doing those road projects or those uh, water treatment plant projects or habitat restoration projects, you have a common vision and list of contacts. Don, did I see your hand up? No? Okay. Mike? I, that sounds great. It does. That would be a great project. My, my, my concern with that, though, is so many of these plans are short-lived. Um, environmental regulation changes very, very quickly, and so by the time we think we've all gotten together and decided on something, a federal interpretation, or state or local for that matter, will, will change, and then what we all agreed on won't work anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that, to me, is the biggest challenge. It's if, if the regulations were somewhat stagnant, it would be a lot easier, um, but they're constantly changing and it's hard for I think for any one of us to even have an idea what the other's regulations are currently at in order to keep it all coordinated but I mean I would love that it would make everyone's life a lot easier other folks on the panel have a perspective Mike you had your Michael you had your hand up earlier sure okay Paul yeah I was just gonna say from the Corps of Engineers perspective um, there's three ways that we generally engage. Uh, Steve already said uh, the regulatory role through the um, uh, navigable waters. That's one way of engagement. The other, another way of engagement is through emergency operations. And there's you know certain thresholds to be met for the Corps to get involved in, in uh, emergency operations and outreach. And then the third one is um, silver jackets. And that's that's basically, uh, the core saying, hey, look, the, there is a, a flood risk management expertise at the core. Maybe there's no federal projects um, that we manage up there, but how can we leverage the federal expertise we have with other agencies and make a coordinated effort to reach out to communities? So that's that's basically the three ways that I, if from a core of engineers perspective, that um, we, we tend to engage. I guess I'll just throw a general comment out there when relating to community engagement, community involvement, and kind of how agencies work with uh, integrating community. Uh, that conversation is, um, I've sat on both sides of the table, and I think having realistic expectations and meeting milestones and, and goes to communication, but just in general, painting the picture of what's Realistic. What 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 can realistically be accomplished in in a period? And um, you know, regulations change, and the Sandy River could change. You know, 
three weeks from now from what we're looking at today. So I think just making sure that as a as a group, I don't have a, a, a great answer or a solution for a, a decision making, but I think engagement just needs to be realistic in terms of you know, how quickly things can be accomplished. Um, nothing, things don't happen overnight from a federal kind of standpoint. Will the doctrine of the upper Sandy erosion study be speed any of this along by the county? I mean, right now we have this analysis that we had to lay the footwork of what we could do as a neighborhood. Instead of just going out and starting to re put revetments every hundred feet according to each property owner's desire, we decided we need to have an upper Sandy River analysis. So we picked the guru of hydrogeomorphology <laughs> to lay out the modeling and come up with conclusions <coughs> about what could be done and what couldn't be done. So now we have this analysis, but it's not, it's being ignored, so to speak. It, we're dancing around it. Instead of coming to the conclusion that there is risk up here, there's serious risk, and there's ways to mitigate this risk and dissolve this risk, get, get people out of the way of it. But we're dancing around this without a hitting it head on. And that, as a community uh, person here, fully involved in this, this really irritates me that we just keep dancing around this problem. We talk about it, but we don't address it. And we need to address it head on. That's how I look at it. We spent the money, we got the best analysis we possibly could, but we're doing nothing. Is there a need from your perspectives for that uh, you know, analysis? Risk map, it's mapping analysis and planning. Is there a need for the analysis to be regulatory in order to uh, change the decision making on the part of your agencies? Understand this, I mean, they're, they're big agencies with a whole body of legal and regulatory implications behind them. Is that, is that needed? Not for us, we're all voluntary. <laughs> well, um, yeah. our water, our water line, which you have the exact same problem we have. Your your water line was done, put in at the. I mean, your force main rather was put in at the same time as our water line. It's out of the same bore pit. It's in the same configuration and at the same risk. Yet when I approached FEMA about um, uh, possible funding for uh, mitigation of that issue. Um, I was told that you you could do nothing because um, it was not considered imminent. If it were considered imminent, if it were going on at the time, or but because once the event passes, it's no longer imminent. And so FEMA couldn't do anything about it. Uh, it had to be in direct jeopardy at the moment for them to do anything. Um, and in, in, in concert with what Murph is asking, the study shows that it is, in fact, in imminent danger. Can that be adopted in some way to change your regulation that would allow you to do something like that, to address something like that, to help um, uh, Wes or to help us with our water situation, with our water line? Uh, because apparently right now the regulations don't allow you to do it. So I, yeah, so I hear what you're saying is we had this study and it, it clearly indicates that there's a zone which is at higher risk than other areas. And, um, you know, one of the things that um, you're probably witnessing when you say, oh, I'm frustrated, we keep on dancing around it, is what we, we have to operate within certain mechanisms um, that we have to, to adopt it into some sort of higher risk zone. And so what we're trying to do here is get our heads together and say, what, what, how can we do it? And I don't think it's an obvious path forward because it is a unique thing. Um, it's not something that we have, uh, uh, like, like I said, a mechanism for adopting and in, in other places. So it's kind of at the forefront of innovation, if you will. And so it's, it's a matter of like, okay, well, what's the best way to do it? And I don't think anybody has a great answer right now. It's going to take a collaboration to get to get there. So that's, that's my input that I have on that. I, um, I just wanted to follow up on what Don just brought up because at one of the the work sessions that we did when we had a community involvement specialist from the Corps of Engineers come out on this uh, national program we were on, and we, we finally got Department of State Lands, the 
Corps of Engineers, a number of folks in the room at the same time to answer questions like this, um, was we, we, we put up whether or not the Corps of Engineers and the permitting process for this, you know, whether there might need to be a, a permit or some regulatory capacity that's fine-tuned for the channel migration issue specifically, that uh, based on the, the dynamics, based on the, the timing, the setbacks, the, the nature of erosion versus flooding, there seem to be in the, in the, the, the language and the, the regulatory framework that was, that's currently in place, it, it just kind of stumbles when it comes to actually helping to deliver what's needed in a permitting process. And if they might think about a way to, to dial that in a little bit more so it, it has an immediate uh, application to the issues going on here. And I, I'm not getting into the weeds on, on what all that language is, but it was something that a number of people pointed out of how their hands were tied when it came to the emergency process for bank restoration, stabilization, as well as the long-term uh, window for doing that kind of work. And I would say that would also apply to, you know, fish passage and, and, and water quality and all the other federal regulations, too. The, the other thing I want to add is that um, my experience talking about the agencies as a, uh, as a single entity can sometimes be challenging. So to talk about FEMA, um, you got no from one part of FEMA. And, the, and then I think, so I think the value of a group like this can be, was that the right part of FEMA to be asking the question? So from a pre-disaster mitigation funding standpoint, there may very well be opportunities to look at the, that infrastructure and if the cost benefit of doing uh, a, a modification or a change to that infrastructure pencils, then there might be other FEMA um, programs or potentially even non-FEMA programs. I mean, maybe it's an economic development administration pot of funding that we don't know of. And so then, then the question is, do we need an EDA person on the panel to say, hey, this had, going back to the business, this has critical um, implications for the restoration of, of small businesses if that infrastructure is impacted. And so we need to funnel economic development administration funds. I'm not saying that those are available, but, it, but in, from my perspective, that may be the direction um, we might need to head. I'm looking at the clock, and I want to transition into the next phase. So let's take about three or four more minutes to kind of wrap this um, conversation. Um, Don? Just real quick, I like Mike Gessner's comment about that pre emergency authorization. Great idea. Yeah. But also, on the effluent discharge from the sewage treatment plant, I've watched it be installed two different times in the same place. And it's time to just quit discharging in the river and do a surface discharge somewhere in the valley and just get get off that track of discharging in the river and get modern or get alternative. Do like they do in other places where they put in multiple ponds and discharge clean water, but not effluent. Steve, quickly. That, I think you, you said that the magic phrase of pre-disaster mitigation, which is a FEMA framework for funding and planning and action that is not a disaster response, but recognizing the imminent risk in some way. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's that's sort of a, a conceptual thing that we're talking about. There's two levels of response. One is after the things happen, but the preventative medicine is where we, we have some ideas now of where general approaches and even specific locations for preventative medicine <laughs> but the resources and the planning that we tend to bring to these things are most often more sort of post-disaster response, but we, how do we build the bridge to these pre-disaster preparatory, anticipatory risk reduction things, pro programs and actions, and, and where are the resources that will allow us to do that in sensible ways that it's, it's complementary. It doesn't replace post-disaster response communications, whatever it is, but it's more productive, it's cheaper, it's more durable, it, at least from our perspective, it meets the criteria of what we talk about because if you get out in front of it and you're not waiting for the emergency disaster response, which is more expensive and less effective. Sure. Mike? Just one more thing on this pre-permit. Uh, pre That's what we're going to call it, pre-permit. Um, it's also identifying all the groups, did that go off? All the groups that we still need to engage with. Um, you know, we still have 
I mean, this is great, but ODFW is another one. Oregon DSL is another one. DEQ is another one. Um, ODOT actually does get involved in these when we end up getting federal highway money as opposed to FEMA money. And so it's every single one of these, when we have the emergency after the fact, we're trying to scramble and engage everybody very quickly. But in order to have that, the plans all line up, those, yep, we have to have every partner in the room because if we miss one, the entire plan might not be legal anymore. So. But it, there is precedent for sort of pre-event policy making. The uh, um, American Planning Association has a uh, pre-event recovery ordinance for catastrophic e events as an example. So as a, as a county or even as a, a city, um, you could develop that ordinance ahead of time and pre-adopt it. And so there's models for that kind of thinking out there. I don't know how that would work in a, in a permitting standpoint, but it's certainly worth potentially talking about. Yeah, I, I think it would be difficult. By the way, I left out uh, <laughs> NIMPS and NOAA. Uh, they're the most important one because <laughs> um, no one's going to tell them what to do. Um, Wes lost two lines. We've lost two lines. They've put in the third line, so have we. The study shows clearly why it happened. Um, yet we don't seem to have a mechanism in place to use that in, that information to preemptively move to prevent it from happening a third time. It doesn't seem to be there. So if we could work on that, that would be really helpful. That would be a positive step forward. If we could streamline the permitting process in a, in a way that is more real world when it comes to, and I understand legalities and I get it. It's not that you're not trying. I totally get it. Um, but if there were some way that that could be streamlined, that would be a great step forward. Um, perhaps a, a way of looking for FEMA to look at, um, a, and, and maybe it already exists, a way to um, uh, free funding for projects before the event occurs based on the best science available, instead of being uh, reactive, be proactive. Um, that would be a great step forward. For our community to see upstream um, uh, floodplain reconnection and those types of projects would be a great step forward for us based on the success we believe we saw in this last event. Um, there were problems with it, which I'd like to talk with you about, um, but, but overall it worked and it worked well. And so those will all be great step forward for us, I believe. Anything else anybody wants to add? The last statement. Just related to the habitat, if, if a project um, were proposed for habitat restoration that was framed only as habitat restoration and not framed as erosion control or anything like that, is that acceptable to the community? The project that the Watershed Council undertook was in fact a habitat restoration project, floodplain reconnection, um, uh, watershed enhancement, that was their goal. That wasn't our goal. Our goal was flood mitigation, to bring um, uh, protection to the homeowners, to the community, to the infrastructure. Um, we, what we saw was a way to marry those two goals to reach a common goal, and it was successful. And so, yes, a, a, a totally, um, a, for instance, there is a large oxbow upstream from Timberline Rim, a large floodplain that has been uh, disconnected. If that were reconnected, it would be purely a water uh, watershed enhancement, purely a Sandy River Basin uh, improvement, uh, habitat improvement, but it would give clear um, uh, uh, flood relief for anyone downstream from that. In fact, the closer to it you were, the more relief you would get from it. And so, yes, I believe that that would be acceptable. It, it is a hard sell. I have, it's been an uphill slog for me, big time. But it worked. It worked. And so, yes. In speech, I, I learned that there's an axiom of tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them. And in this particular case, from a, from a commerce uh, and business and community standpoint, and from this group, 
uh, you know, I might expand upon that axiom is, is, you know, from the lessons learned, tell them what the lessons you learned are and how you're going to fix those lessons. Fix the, the problems and then tell them how you fix the problems. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of conversation going on that the community is not involved in or privy to. And the, what the community wants to hear is the, the problems that were encountered in the 2011 storm and previous storms and what the lessons were that were learned and what you guys did to, or what we all did to improve upon those lessons and make it better for commerce. They don't want to give you answers. They want to hear what the answers are uh, and what has taken place and how it's going to be better for them in the long run as far as tourism and commerce and, and the residents on the mountain. Um, one of the things, one of the things that we learned um, in, in our attempts to try to bring relief to our community and protection to our community was, is that there was really no money or, or no push, no drive um, from the different entities that are involved, whether they be um, uh, uh, governmental agencies or they be private entities uh, who are interested, such as the Watershed Council, that they're, they're, it isn't that they don't want to help, it's that the regulations are not set, uh, geared for that. And so some you, somehow you have to tailor it to fit. And um, when there is all kinds of money for habitat restoration, for fish, and for all of that, there just isn't any for homeowners to protect homes or infrastructure, and, or very little, I should say. And so by, it, by helping the community to understand that, in fact, there is funding available that can bring relief as long as you tailor the project such that it fits the goals of the agencies involved that you can, in fact, accomplish those. Not only, not only then will they pay for it, they will support you in that instead of opposing you in it. And, and, and again, don't get me wrong, not opposing because you yourselves don't want to see it, but your, your, your regulations don't allow it, if, if you will. And so you have to work within the constraints of your um, uh, um, uh, charter, if you will, your mandates. And by doing it this route, not only do we, did we not encounter uh, opposition, but instead we got full support from all of the um, uh, entities that normally would oppose you. And not only did they pay for it all, they took full responsibility for everything. And so it is a win-win all around for Timberline Rim, and it was a habitat restoration project. So, so. I think this is a really good transition, because we're going to move from sort of short-range uh, decision-making and talk about what would, what would longer term, maybe policy changes um, look like? You know, how do we better align uh, the resources available to the um, frameworks and mandates that are out there? So the um, framing question that we came up with um, for this section is imagine Clackamas County embraces more of a pre-covery kind of um, perspective, that, that we actually are pre-planning for disaster recovery. So maybe instead of thinking about replacing that water line or, or um, some transmission line. Maybe we are thinking more in terms of how do we get that out of the river altogether so you don't have to deal with that. That would be kind of a pre-covery kind of mindset. What if Clackamas County became a national leader in the use of economic, um, infrastructure, and land use policy? What if we adopted the channel migration zone, in other words, um, to adapt to chronic uh, flooding and channel migration? You know, what would it look like if Clackamas County took a new policy approach to reduce flood and channel migration risks in the upper Sandy Basin? So throw that to the, the panel first. What would that look like if you had a whole new regulatory environment? Or uh, um, what would new policies from your various perspectives maybe look like? That's an easy softball right before lunch on a Monday morning, right? You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. So something that I've um, mentioned in the uh, 
talked with FEMA and, and NOAA Fisheries in regard to the biological <coughs> opinion on the National Flood Insurance Program in Oregon, and the, the and National Marine Fisheries Service um, wrote into the BIOP and the Reasonable and Prudent Alternative uh, uh, recommendation to FEMA that they somehow include channel migration zones in uh, in a regulatory um, in their regulatory mapping, which you know is obviously a huge um, change. Deal. But one of the things that I thought about in that conversation is um, it, on the Oregon coast. On the Oregon coast, uh, there is a prohibition on bank armoring for properties that were not developed prior to it's like 1972 or something like that. And it's both either individual. The, the standard has to do with if there were services to the area, then um, it's considered developed. Um, but then also individual properties that wouldn't have services if there was no structure on it, they're, they're considered undeveloped. And so it doesn't, that rule doesn't prevent people from building, but it lets them know ahead of time that if something happens to the, the shorefront, it's on them. They can't go in and try to, try to re-armor. And I just wonder if that um, philosophy, I guess, might spread some of the ownership of the risk to people who are um, are developing, and I know this is going on into that place of uh, places that are not developed yet. But I just kind of in the back of my mind in this conversation, I just think, well, that there are places that are developing while we're having a conversation about how to protect some place that already is developed. So um, modeling something after the coastal. Um, um, uh, Pro prohibition on bank armoring might be something to look at. Steve? I, I think what we've learned so far backs that up. I mean, from our perspective, not only is armoring the sandy illegal, it's horribly ineffective for doing what it's aimed to do because it's that single property perspective, because it's counter to the actual erosive and geomorphic force of the river, it's fatal. It's just an expensive, destructive, habitat negative that's going to collapse on itself and cause more trouble for the adjacent properties and the ones across the river. And, and I think to a large extent that the most recent general permit that the Corps propagated after 2011 backs away from that without entirely prohibiting it. And I think it, it's also that, that the, the need to flip from an emergency response where unpermissible things are permitted in, in the name of emergency to this more anticipatory idea that, well, you have to reduce the risk before the, the risk has knocked you flat. Um, and you, it, it leads you to different responses, including softening the floodplain, not armoring its banks and trying to retain it in a place where it won't be retained. So I think, I think that's, we've sort of taken steps to address that in the reality and the fact that recognizing that riprap and river, river hardening are not compatible with wild fish habitat, and since wild fish habitat has a inflexible and, and effective uh, influence, it, it's, it's edging that way. But the, again, that, that becomes back to community perception, too. Right. Because there's a disconnect between what I think is useful to protect my property and what is more effective in a, in a, in a broad scheme and sharing the risk when people realize it and they're right. deep into it, like Don and Murph and Steve and, and Don, who are been in this process for a while. That was, that was going to be my question, is what would, what would Patty, if, if she was still here, what would you all say to that kind of approach? You know, given the you know, real fear and, and real emotional attachment and real economic attachment to property. So with a, a new building permit, uh, the county issues a conditions of approval with their permit. And I'd like to see in those conditions of approval when it's a riverfront property, it state that there would never be allowed rip wrapping to save the structure if it was built. And part of it is we have <clears throat> in the ordinance a setback requirement of 100 feet, but there's exceptions to those rules that allow lots to, to be developed, even though they can't meet that setback. So. As an example, we had a property that the owner wanted to incorporate rip wrapping into the initial development of his property. Fortunately, the county denied that one. So 
I would just say saying no to a couple of developments would go a long way in our area to set an example of this lot is not appropriate to develop, but it puts a burden on the county of now what can that owner do with the property and they've paid taxes for years on it maybe. So maybe that facilitates the buyout idea. Not, maybe I'm not making sense here, but it, I mean, it really is about somewhere along the line, taking that hard line of saying no from a county permit process, but also needing the agencies to back them up when they start to do that by giving them mapping and regulations that say somewhere along the line, we've crossed the line of too much. It, it kind of makes me wonder, I mean, one of the disciplines that's not represented, I don't know if, if this has been part of your conversations in the past, but is, is legal. I mean, when, when you have a, when, you know, I, when I went through school, I learned about the bundle of property rights. Well, when the bundle includes something that could be washed away, you know, the, I think the coast becomes an interesting um, corollary, right? Of, you know, where do the legal... <laughs> What's, the, yeah, Mike? Well, whoops. That's, that's probably okay. That's just for show? Yeah, that's probably okay. I guess you spit. Um, didn't the county originally say no to part of Timberline Rim back in, was that the 70s or 80s? And the original development. Said no, and then we got sued and a judge overturned it. Yeah, the judge removed the property from the floodplain. Yeah, solid science. So, you know, it is always, a, it's true, is we can say we can do whatever we want as a county, but we all know that's not true, right? So, um, it, it, again, it does become a wicked problem. It's, uh, you know, and then it becomes, it gets bigger than us and then becomes state and potentially federal, depending on what regulation is applying at that particular time. But, but I think it's, you're right also, Don, that, that it becomes, in progress, like, discussion you want to say yes and there's got to be a no and in this case to say well no you can't do that and here's what you can do and here's what we can do with you I mean that again that's where adopting a, a more anticipatory structure well actually no you can't do that and we have some alternative tracks that we can work with you on to, to do what's right by the river and somehow addresses your concerns but that that's that's part of this what would it look like is the the no and part i completely agree and and i know here that's our philosophy with with reviewing development is if you can't do something how do we still help you accomplish as many of your goals as you can while still complying with the law thoughts from the panel One, one last one is that I, I mean I think there there are models. I think Clackamas has a discussion where some of the regulatory structure for channel migration zone management in Washington exists uh, on comparable rivers, and and I think the deputy county administrator may have just come from one of those counties. So there's there's existing knowledge on some of those things at a policy level, but again we haven't. Or, quite yet taken the step to say, well, are those the right solutions for here? Can we adapt some of those? But again, that goes back to that state and the requirement to have a basis in state law to hang it on. Another trick. Well, I just wanted to overtly state, uh, in 2015, when the Channel Migration Zone study was about to be released, we uh, had pre-meetings with um, the county commissioners to bring this to their attention before it went out, just so they had a chance to understand what was coming and even though these maps the maps that are back there some of you have them are advisory still they've not been formally adopted or put into any regulatory overlay um, our three most conservative uh, commissioners at the time one of them being the chair all voluntarily said we need to put a moratorium on new development in these areas I mean they they, they just, well, it was it was a very strong reaction well of course we've got to do that um, and we went back and met with county council uh, to legally see how would that look like. And, the, and part of it is around the legal basis for what a moratorium is. And um, despite their concern at that time, the, the council said that the moratorium is not the appropriate framework for doing something 
in, in that kind of capacity. It's, it's, it's a short-lived, I mean, kind of based on Oregon law, it, it's, but there's the, the real way would be for us to adopt the maps and have a regulatory overlay in the floodplain development uh, ordinances that had restrictive language uh, and enforcement there. And um, that's where you know, we're still saying, you know, we need a framework to work with them uh, somehow that gives us a basis for working, you know, we push up against it, uh, we can align it, but uh, yeah, until we do this, um, we don't have a legal framework for saying yes, no, and, and, or maybe. From the infrastructure providers, are there other kind of policy mechanisms that could be in play, or uh, I know we don't have a kind of economic development professionals in the room, are there, are there economic policies that maybe more market-based that could be employed? Well, I'll just throw out that one of the, the kind of the visioning concepts that have been behind where we are, what did, you know, because we've been acquiring properties uh, in the floodplain for going on 10 years now um, through our office in a post-flood environment with FEMA disaster grants. Very limited money, very targeted to total loss properties to just give the owners some recourse. But we've been acquiring these properties. What do you do with those properties? How do you utilize them? How do you have a strategic plan for connecting them? And so on the Sandy, you know, we asked within the weeks after the flood, who, who's interested in this idea of buyouts? Because we didn't know how much money we had at the time. And we had a lot of hands at different times that went up of people who were just curious and had an interest. Um, but we had limited money. And, and within a few years, I think people, their hands went back down again. They've, they've gotten back into their comfort zone. They understand that there's a risk, but it's much more abstract six years later. But I think, you know, how we, we, have a, we have to have a strategy for how do we use these properties and connect them strategically so that we, we can demonstrate you know, the benefit of now having some land to work with. And that, that voluntarily saying, you're, you're willing, you're done. I'm, I'm ready. If I have a way to get out because I can't really get my money back because now people know how dangerous this is. If I can find a way out, I'll take it. And then we can collectively have more room to, to work with and so at an economic level, maybe that opens up, uh, you know, more access to the river means more fly fishermen, more people who are using it that translates into more opportunities. It's a new paradigm that, you, you know, you're, you're giving something up, but it's giving something back. And so you've got to rethink that challenge into an opportunity that collectively people would be willing to live with. And that might be a generation's worth of, of, of change and action. But if you have that vision that's overtly stated and agreed upon, then when that, I'll leverage the disaster, the recovery period is where you can make the most transformative change when you can bring all this to bear in a concentrated way. And, and you really have to have that pre-covery approach. So you're doing this in a deliberative, mindful way rather than simply a reactive way. Yeah, Michael. So just, um Two cents from my experience at the Washington Department of Ecology. Um, your neighbors to the north do have some programs that are relevant to this. Um, first, just to the talk of pre-covery um, and thinking about floodplains from a sort of preemptive perspective. I think it's important to think about like moonshots and pie in the sky. Um, you know, if we're talking about what would it look like if it was perfect, um, Washington is certainly not doing this perfectly, but um, they do have a statewide program called Floodplains by Design, which I know some of you are familiar with. Um, that is funded by the legislature um, on, during the biennium, and they put huge amounts of money, um, tens of millions of dollars every two years, that are um, available for these really big integrated projects. They're multi-benefit projects, um, and they've seen a lot of really good work done on that that has met sort of that economic restoration along with reducing risk. So I think that's one thing to just be aware of. It took a lot of time, a lot of coordination from the Nature Conservancy, uh, the Department of Ecology, um, Department of Natural Resources. So there were a lot of different agencies that were involved in thinking about how to shape that program and um, working with elected officials to get them to appreciate the value of it and get buy-in um, and advocate for the program. Um, but I think that that's an important model and it really does um, involve a lot of that coordination across the different agencies and it provides a forum for that coordination. 
Um, and the other thing I would say is just to the um, just to, to point out that there are models in terms of regulating um, channel migration from Washington. It's still in the very early stages, but there are multiple counties in Washington state that have, through the authority of the Coastal Zone Management Act, um, instituted county level or city level regulations that restrict development in known channel migration zones. And their maps are not nearly as good as the ones Dogami produced. Um, there's still some questions as to whether or not those things are going to hold up when they go to court. My understanding is that they have not yet, and there's a, a full expectation that they will be brought to court. Um, but there are definitely models from Washington that I think are important to look at. Thanks. Uh, let's kind of wrap this up. I feel the energy level kind of dropping. We're all starting to get hungry. Um, Tamara or Mike, not to put either of you on the spot, I just want to ask from your uh, the FEMA perspective or from the governor's office if you have anything to add just before we wrap this piece up. I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, it, this is an intriguing conversation, and um, it's what we like to see. Um, I'm in the mitigation realm of FEMA, and, and it was brought up earlier. You ask FEMA a different question, different um, division, you will get different answers. We all operate under our certain regs, pre-disaster, post-disaster, and we work through um, the Office of Emergency Management, typically, to administer um, pre-mitigation or post-mitigation grants. So um, we do that and they work with the county. So how cities see that is through multiple levels of implementation of mitigation grants. Um, the mapping, the um, channel migration mapping and the discussion is right on par where we, um, we like to take these types of conversations to push action and to prevent people from um, having to go through it over and over and over again in a floodplain. So, um, I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you, Jay. Well, thanks for inviting me. This is a, obviously, um, I live in the county, so I'm very, I like what I'm hearing here, and I appreciate everybody's comments. And, you know, um, regional solutions, Michael brought them up. You know, they, they got $4 million of lottery bond funding authorized. Um, so they are you know, working with the different 11 economic regional districts of the state of Oregon and their staff to get ideas of and input. And their focus is on economic development, not on habitat type stuff. But they have a close relationship with our natural resource group uh, within the agency. And we're seeing that starting to play out with the Wildland Fire Recovery Council that the governor's activated for not only the Eagle Creek, she's going to do the same down in Brookings for the Checo Bar Fire. So, you know, this is um, not baby steps, but we're not jumping right into, you know, the Super Bowl on, on recovery efforts. Um, I, I'd like to think that somehow we could get back to mitigation because the more we can do on mitigation, the better off we are. So lessons learned from big events usually are anything to do with permitting, you know, find out who the permitting agency is and what does it take to suspend that permit for a period of time so that you can do your life safety and immediate response piece before uh, you get um, worked up about, well, who's going to authorize the permit. So state agencies have done that around earthquake stuff. And so I think it would be probably not a bad idea. I really like the idea here using the silver jackets and the Oregon solutions to move this forward. And um, you know, if there's any part you want of myself or anybody else in the governor's office, just let me know and I'll tap on their shoulder and, and get them focused on this. Thank you, Mike. That's your take. Can we thank the panel? Thank you. Thank you.